Hey guys, for this tutorial I'm going to be covering the Redshift Unified Sampler. And so a lot of people have no idea how this system actually works and they get confused adding sampling settings, increasing the maximum settings, the minimum settings, and they have no idea how it's really working behind the scenes to actually clean up noise and what's an optimized and efficient way to use it. And so I'll be covering the entire process but first, before I actually show you how to do this in a practical sense, in use, and in this example scene, I'm going to cover the background information of what it's actually doing behind the scenes. And so I've made a graphic to cover this that will, I'll be adding in a link to in the description so you can download it yourself and read it and go through it all. And I'm just going to skim through it right now, just kind of giving you a background of what the Unified Sampler is doing and how it works behind the scenes. And so let's open up the graphic. And so pretty much the Redshift uses a, an adaptive unified sampling engine, which basically means it's being intelligent about how it's firing rays. And so <clears throat> it decides, hey, is this pixel noisy? Is this pixel no longer noisy? Should I keep firing rays? Should I stop? And this is what the adaptive sampling engine does. And so it's actually really efficient to use this. This is what you want to use. There's a more brute force method that you can you you can use, but I, I would I wouldn't because then you lose the advantage of actually using redshifts um, by a sampling engine. And so the you can the instructions to do it are here. But basically the most important thing you need to know to have the adaptive sampling engine intelligently working and turned on is you have to make sure that your local samples, and by local samples, uh, that means specular samples, refractions, your lights, ambient occlusion, your brute force GI. So like when you go into the uh, option settings in your render, I'm talking about the, the brute force GI. This is your local samples. Your uh, If you override the, the uh, materials like refraction, AO, lights, etc. Or the, the more efficient way to do it in terms of optimization is you click on the actual material, the object with the material, and you increase the samples, for example, for the refraction or for the reflection. And you do this for each material in your scene. And that's the most optimized route, but if, you know, you don't have time to go material through, you know, material by material with each object in your scene, to optimize that much, you could just obviously under output go to sampling overrides and instead just increase this to whatever number you're looking for. And this will do it across the entire scene. And we'll be using this uh, for the example later on. But just know that the most optimized way is to do it on a material basis. And that way certain materials get optimized a little more, you know, they get more samples or they get less. But let's get back to that. Um, graphic and so you have to have more local samples which is what I was just talking about lights GI brute force GI specular then you have maximum samples in your unified sampler so again if your uh, maximum samples here six, which is 16 this is right now this is stock so this is what you're when you open up a scene this is what it comes with and if your max samples are, let's say, I don't know, you, you throw in 256 and your brute force GI is still 16 or your lights or everything else is smaller than this, than the max sample count, you're actually not taking advantage of the intelligence of the unified sampler. And so you want to make sure that local samples are larger than maximum unified sampler samples. And the reason is because the unified sampler settings of the min and max is actually, these two right here, the unified sampler is actually designed to work on anti-aliasing, depth of field, motion blur, those type of things. And you want actually your, your individual samples on reflection, refraction, these to focus on their own, separate from these. So you shouldn't, th these should only be working basically intelligently for AA, stuff like that. While the other samples will take care of reflections, glossy re reflections, specular stuff, you know, refraction, you want these to do all the heavy lifting. 
and then what's left over, the unified sampling engine, cleans up. And so now that we have that squared away, the minimum samples, we're, we're going to go through just certain terms. So minimum samples is the minimum amount of rays fired. Maximum samples is the max. Local samples is, like I said, the local samples fired, like specular, refraction, lights, ambient occlusion, and brute force GI. And then we have another setting, the adaptive error threshold. And so what this does is it, it basically tells it how sensitive the engine has to be. So here's adaptive error threshold. So stock, it comes in at 0, 1. And larger numbers mean less sensitive. And smaller numbers actually mean it's more sensitive. And so how you use this is basically this tells the engine to be more intelligent and sensitive about noise per pixel. So then it, it says basically, oh, this pixel's a little noisier. Let's fire more rays. And then it keeps pushing until it gets to max samples. And so we're going to keep the stock for now. And uh, like I said, I'll be going over how this works later on after I, I describe all the terms. And so to, once you have your local samples, to know how many real samples are fired on top of the max unified samples, there's an equation that basically says local samples divided by max samples equals the primary rays per pixel. So this is how many actual rays get fired. And so uh, I give examples in, in this um, image explaining how it all works. So for example, it, and this is why the adaptivity is actually lower if you have higher locals, lower local samples than higher max samples. So for example, if you have 256 local samples and you divide it by 512 max, you get 0.5. Redshift can't do 0 0.5, 0 0.2. It can only do whole numbers. So that, that means that it rounds it up to one, which means there's only one... Um, primary ray basically being fired and then the 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 rest are just local the locals being negated there's only one local sample being fired and then the rest are all unified max samples which means the unified sampling engine which is supposed to only take care of uh depth of field and motion blur and stuff and anti-aliasing is now working harder because it's also working on the specular refractions etc cetera, etc cetera, that local samples are supposed to be taken care of so you're making it work harder and the unified sampling engine wasn't designed to work on that stuff. It's supposed to handle AA and all the other things and motion blur and stuff. And so you're going to get noisier and slower renders. So again, keep your local samples always higher than your max samples. So now that we know this, you can tell how many total samples are being fired in your minimum and your maximum using primary rays per pixel and multiplied by your minimum and max that you have on your unified. So for example, let's say you have 16 minimum samples, 512 max samples, and 1024 local samples. Your 1024 gets divided by your max, and that's 2. So then that's 2 primary rays per pixel. And now that we have the primary rays per pixel, you can then multiply that by your minimum in the unified sampler, and then you get 32. So what's actually happening, your real minimum is 32 pixels total, which is your local samples plus your unified samples. And so then same thing applies to max. And um, what you end up with is you have a, a gradient, basically. Redshift will fire now between 32 all the way up to 1024. And how it decides how many, you know, when to stop is dependent on your adaptive error threshold, the intelligence sensitivity, basically, we were talking about earlier. So if the small, the smaller, the more sensitive that adaptive setting is set at, basically Redshift says, okay, keep firing, it's still too noisy, keep firing, keep firing, until it finally hits your 1024 max samples. And so if you, if you could, you could increase or lower this and basically it tells Redshift, you know, let's give up sooner or let's keep going and going and going. And so for this example here, this, this example image, I turned on the show samples setting. And so this can be found right here underneath adaptive error threshold. So if you check this off, what happens is your render gives back a black and white image like this. 
and white means that you hit pure white means that you hit your maximum samples pure black means you hit you you fired one basically and then moved on and so that's how you can think of it the the gradient of black to white means more samples were fired the closer to white it gets less samples the closer to, to black it gets and so all four of these images are all using 16 minimum samples and the only difference is the max and locals and I double them each time so you could see the examples so this is 128 max 256 local 256 max 512 local 512 max 1024 and so on and notice how the render times actually don't increase that much you know c considering you're going down and actually this one's a little faster and basically uh, I'll cover why this one's special later on and <clears throat> what's happening is if you look at the uh, the way the, the the gradient is notice how this pattern is the same even on this side and even on this side the only difference is that the value shifted so the reason that this is happening is you, if you think of this as basically a, a gradient ramp the 256 image up here is clamped so let's say this red bar represents I don't know what one of these pixels right here right this pixel is saying redshift is saying okay I'm gonna give up at I don't know 192 samples you know and then it stops and this same pixel if I were to render it now with a higher max and local that's double the amount of max and local of the last frame all it did was basically shift the 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 goalpost the spectrum the 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 scale further but the adaptive intelligence is saying oh well even in this Im in this image even though we have more room for 512 samples all it's doing is the engine is still being smart and saying hey we're still going to stop at roughly 192 and then so same things happening here in 1024 if that same pixel is, is fired all that's happening is that now the goalposts for black and white are now 0 to 1024 so the gradient doubled again but it's still stopping at 192 samples and so that's why the uh, patterns look the same and the render time is roughly the same it's because the engine is still being smart about when to stop firing so even though we have more technically more wiggle room more space to keep firing and so that's why this image has a lot more white in it basically what's happening is the adaptive engine is firing all the way to the max which is two, uh, 256 if you multiply uh, these by two which would be the two primary samples per ray and so what ends up happening is it's hitting its max sooner and then this image has a little more space so it's only hitting its max in areas that really need a lot of work like these little uh, the super glossy reflection the uh, little rim light here the the specular and so as you keep increasing your gradient space basically the the goalposts of how many samples are available the overall image is getting darker because this wall isn't getting you know it's it's nowhere near hitting the max level while uh, this wall even though it's the same amount of samples for example right here 192 this is closer to the max because there's only 256 total and so that's why it's closer to the white while on this side this is barely even you know it's still in the darks it's barely getting close to the max so why is this one still slower than this one for example the reason is because this is clamping how many samples can it can hit and so on this side s certain things like uh, little anti-aliasing like stuff like this little specular stuff it redshifts 
adaptivity is going to say, you know what, this still isn't clean enough. We're going to keep firing. We're going to keep firing. We're going to keep firing. And so we have way more space for it to keep hitting these little tough areas of noise. While on this side, it basically got to 256, which is why it's all white in these areas. And it just, that's it. You know, it can't keep um, firing more rays. While on this side, no, instead of being clamped to that, it, it keeps going and going and going and going until it reaches its max in these white areas. And that's why it added a couple seconds. But if you were to compare these two, this one's going to have a little more quality in these little areas. But overall, the image is basically identical in, in the backgrounds because the adaptive engine is smart enough to say, you know what, this wall, we're good. We don't need any more here. These little shadows, spots right here, we hit enough. It looks good enough for me. You know, and Redshift will just move on. And so moving the uh, adaptive error threshold basically tells it to either be more sensitive about these little spots or less. And so that I'll, I'll be covering how to use that later on. And so that's what's going on here. And basically you use the show samples override that I, I showed a little second ago, this to get that setting going. And that's how you, you can um, basically without seeing the, the, the fancy GI and colors or anything like that, you just get the black and white image so you can say, hey, this spot is hitting more samples or this spot isn't. You know, It lets you basically troubleshoot your noise a little better. And um, so basically there's another thing going on behind the scenes and it's the way that Redshift is firing these rays in groups and this process is called ray sorting which basically means if you could you can think of it like this like um in the internet you you send packets of information little you know bit groups of information back and forth from you know whatever your your, your server or whatever to your computer and back and the similar process is happening the uh, ray bundles of information are being fired from the G from Redshift to, to the GPU. The GPU processes them. And so Redshift fires these bundle groups at a minimum of 4, 8, 16, and 32 max. So only 32 rays can be fired at the max per time it, fi it samples a pixel. And then so what's happening is each time that, that it fires this 32 group or 16 or whatever as it fires the more at a pixel the more times it hits that pixel the more options the engine the adaptive engine has to work with so if let's say you sampled the pixel with only two groups of 32 what ends up happening is the adaptive engine had only two chances to say should I fire more yes no if yes you know continue and then it stopped and so it, it doesn't have enough wiggle room to be intelligent and adaptive about things. And so you actually want 15, 30 um, clusters. You want ray bundles, basically, ray bundle packets, as I, I refer to them, to be fired. And the reason you want this to happen is because then it gives Redshift the wiggle space of, hey, um, we have 32 chances to see if this pixel is noisy or not so the adaptive engine goes okay fires one group of 32 and it says is it clean no fire another group of 32 is it clean no fire another group of 32 and it, it continues this process until the uh, adaptive error threshold and the intelligence of the engine says you know what the pixels clean let's move on and so if you don't have enough of these ray bundle packets being fired the engine doesn't distinguish whether it's clean or not. It doesn't have enough information to go off of. And so here's the equations and how it all works. And basically, when you, f you fire 32 rays, and let's say the, uh, the min and max don't, aren't, don't work with a 32. So like you, for example, um, where is it at? Let's say you, you're, one of the equations, you don't get a whole number. Like this example, the equation is there's 30, 32 ray bundles, which is the maximum size group that rays can be fired at. And 
you have your max samples minus the 32 minimum because we're using 32 as a, as the minimum and as our, uh, in this example so then you divide that by the 32 group cluster and we get 31 ray bundle packets so that means for 31 times redshift can check that one pixel and decide is it clean or not clean or not and keep firing it might decide that it's clean at number 16 or 5 or, or whatever but 30 it has at least 31 chances to come up with that conclusion and if you don't have enough of these it might just give up at two or three if you have only three or four ray bundle packets and then what ends up happening is the engine just says okay at, at the third one well I can't shoot anymore so it's clean enough even though it wasn't actually clean and so that's why you actually want to have a decent size 15 to 31 for stills without uh, or animations without depth of field or any uh, or you know uh, motion blur stuff like that anti that aren't crazy motion blur should be fine plenty and so what happens if this equation you know you end up not getting a whole number so you get 15.5 for example what is what that actually means is that it's firing 32 15 32 ray groups so it says okay i can fit 15 groups of 32 rays but it still needs to continue to reach its maximum so it gives it one more step but this time since it can't fit all 32 it's going to step down to a smaller number so it's going to step down to 16 and that's another bundle of rays another ray bundle packet but now you're using 16 instead of 32 and then if let's say that didn't fit for some reason it'll you know move down to 8 and then it'll eventually hit 4 as its minimum and to optimize this obviously you want the GPU to be only sending groups of 32 so that way it's always using the full bundle amount but it's not necessary you know it, it, that's if you really want to milk the last bit of optimization but it's it's not necessary but the only reason why I bring this this whole thing up is because if you don't have enough of the ray bundle uh, packets you actually end up with the uh, adaptive sampling engine not being not having enough room to be intelligent and so you actually want to have some for it to work with and so I explain what what what's going on in here and you can read it to get the actual in-depth numbers and, and the equation of why it's doing what it's doing and so an example of what I'm talking about what I just finished talking about is here for example these two images they uh, have the exact same amount of uh, minimum primary rays fired and maximum. So they both have 64, 2048. The difference, though, is that this one is using local samples to get there. So it's using 32 minimum, 1024 max, 2048 local. And so to get to these numbers, again, refer back to the equation that, that I brought up over here local samples divided by max samples equals primary rays per pixel and then your primary rays per pixel are multiplied by your min which gives you your true uh, minimum samples per pixel same thing but max and that gives you your true maximum and so the true minimum and maximum for both images are, are the same the only difference is that this one does not have the uh, local samples it set up like I mentioned in the beginning of all this and so what ends up happening is that the unified sampling is doing all the work in this image while in this image the local samples did all the work mostly and then the unified engine can only focus really on on the stuff where it needs it and so that's why in this image you could see spots that are a lot darker and it kind of just you know appear for example and over here it's it's a smoother gradient but that's because it's it's trying harder to clean this up than in this side where it's saying okay you know local samples are fine let's get it over with and it's done with but the reason this is also smoother on this side is because there's a larger ray bundle packet count which we were just talking about while this one has 31 
And so that's why you get this little smoother gradient rather than the stepping you have here. And that's because each pixel that's fired, it's got more wiggle room to say, hey, is this clean? No, maybe continue. Well, this one has 31, so it's getting there faster. But this is kind of basically a waste because you're using so many that it, it becomes negligible. So that's why 30s, 15 to 30 is usually pretty good. 60 would be if, if you're, you know, you have some intense depth of field and stuff like that. Then you want that much wiggle room for the engine to be smart about how it's cleaning up the pixels. So what happens then if you have a really small amount of these? You know, the, the Ray Bundle packets are, are, are a really small amount. What happens when that, that happens? This is what happens. You end up, even though, again, same, same example, one side is using local samples, and one side local samples and one side isn't so the adaptive engine is being smarter in terms of the uh, the local samples are doing more of the work but it's rendering slower than this side which it shouldn't be doing under normal circumstances and so you're wondering okay why why is this side slower and then what what the reason is that this side has 24 ray bundle groups so it has 24 steps or 24 tries to check the pixel and then it says is it clean no fire more is it clean no more you know fire more while this side only has four and so because this side only has four times to do that it's basically firing once twice you know and then by the fourth time if it even gets to the fourth it could stop sooner it says well, I'm going to give up. You know, it's it's clean enough. And so it's not intelligent enough about how many rays it should be firing. And so that 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 basically you're clamping how many times how intelligent it really is and how many times it should be firing out of the total max. And so while this side has no intelligence in terms of the the local samples, it has a lot more of these, the ray bundle packets to work with. And so it makes the engine overall smarter still. So what you want in, in conclusion, basically, is you want to make sure that the unified sampling engine is doing the work of the aliasing, depth of field, motion blur, and not doing the, the work that the local sample should be doing. And then also, once you do this, you want to make sure that you have a large enough gap. See how the gap for this is only 4 min, 16 max, which is small. That means you could, it can't even fit one uh, ray bundle of 32, you know. And so for this example, to optimize the engine to, so it has more steps, it fires four sets of four, and in, instead of you know whatever the 24 sets of 32. And so what ends up happening is this is actually, while more intelligent in the sense that it has more local samples taking care of the work. It's less intelligent overall because it only has four chances to basically analyze the pixel and either, you know, continue or, or fire more or stop while this side has more. And so the conclusion is basically you want to have enough, a, a, a min and a max that are large enough where the, the uh, variance between the two numbers are big enough that you actually get a nice sized ray bundle packet like 24 for example see this is 256 min 1024 max the gap between the two is large enough that they actually get more ray bundle packets so the, the idea here is that you want to have both a good amount of local samples that are larger than your max but you also want a large enough distance so 16 here would work 16 and 1024 but you want the, the difference here, the variance, to be large enough so that you also get a larger variance of ray bundle packets. And so this is something to keep in mind. A lot of people make the mistake of having small min and not too, you know, maybe 32 max. And you're actually limiting your ray bundle packets. So it's actually not a bad idea to, if you need, you know, do 256 or 512 and 1024 local samples. If you have enough packets your the engine is smart enough again coming back to this to say hey this is enough pixels for this area even though you gave it the option 
of having a higher threshold of maximum and local samples, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go all the way to 1024. It's actually going to be pretty consistent. The engine's smart enough when it's given the proper opportunity with enough ray group counts to uh, basically know when to, when to stop firing. And so, again, this is why I, I mentioned earlier that I'd come back to this, that why this one rendered faster. It's because if you look at the great ray group count, 3.5, which is really 4, this is really 8, but it's firing one instead of one full all it's 732 ray groups and then 116 and so like i mentioned earlier because it could not fit the last 32 group and so the reason this is rendering actually faster is because this one has 15 16 steps basically to analyze the pixel and go is it noisy clean it's clean okay let's stop and so this image would actually be rendering faster and cleaner than the previous one, even though the max and the local are lower on this one. And so that's because it has more steps to basically analyze the pixel, and then the adaptive engine decides to either continue firing or not fire. And so that you want to have a balance of a large enough variance and ray group counts and then that let the engine do its thing. The engine will be smart about how it decides it. And so now that we have that figured out and squared away the, the principles, and like I said, I'll be uploading the, the, the image and you guys can download it and, and read it and actually analyze it all and go, go in depth about it. You might be wondering, okay, what, what, how do I apply all this information? And how do I actually make a cleaner image? using local samples and min and max and all that stuff. So right now, we're just going to go stock. I open this up, and we're going to use just brute force, brute force. I won't be covering the different GI engines. That'll have to be a different video. And right now, we're just keeping it simple with just brute force, brute force, and 15 bounces because this is an interior. And so we have 16 for max, 4 minimum, Adaptive error at stock at 0 0.01, and no overrides on any of the samples. So if we hit render, we're going to get a render basically really quickly, but it's super noisy. Just looking at this, you know, you're, you're thinking, okay, how am I going to actually, you know, clean this up? You zoom in, and it's like, wow, it's super noisy. The first step to cleaning this image is you want to get rid of all the distractions so let's let's just turn off the GI let's turn off everything and let's let's get rid of all the reflections and all, all that stuff and we're just gonna stick to in the uh, system settings there's a material override swatch just turn that on and what that does is it's gonna turn everything into a diffuse 50 percent gray so let's hit render now and what you get is no GI, no nothing, you know, you just get your plain old image. And as you can see, now you can analyze, okay, there's noise coming right here, there's a bunch of noise over there, and you're keeping it simple. So step one, I would say, is first, let's give, give the unified sampling engine some space to work with. I'm going to just try 16, 256. And that already should at least clean up the image just a tad. So let's save that. Do a render. And already, we're getting a much cleaner image just right out of the gate. And the reason is because now the engine has more space to fire more rays. Now it can hit a maximum of 256. And so and whatever the, the current stock uh, light samples are at. And so if you click on the, the, the light, the physical light we got, we have 16 samples. And so what's happening is, since, like I mentioned earlier, since this is a smaller number than our max, we're defaulting all the work to the unified sampler instead of making it do only the anti-aliasing work. 
So what you want to do is you could either increase it on the individual light, like I said, or you could use overrides right here. I'm going to just use overrides because I don't want to go through materials and all that. This is the most optimized route, but again, this is just for tutorial purposes. We're going to just take the quick route and use overrides. And so what you want to do now is you want to actually increase the light samples to at least something higher than this. I'm going to just go with, I don't know, let's try just double, 512, let's just go with, with the double. Why not? And we're going to save that image. We're going to render. And again, loading really quickly. And so now if you zoom in, let's check out some spots. And let's slide between the two. It's a little bit cleaner, see? You can see a difference already. And the render times, this one's actually rendering faster. Six seconds versus the seven seconds of the previous one. And the reason is because now the unified sampler is only worried about unified sampling stuff in terms of the light. It's worrying about depth of field, anti-aliasing, stuff like that, while the local samples are now doing all the work. And that's why this is a higher number. And so now that we've got the light, you know, nice and clean looking, the direct light, let's turn on something else. So the next step in this, we're, we're going to turn off our um, material override. So now we're going to get our materials and we're going to do a render. And now we end up getting our specular, our refraction, our reflections, all that stuff. And we're going to zoom in and see how they're doing. And so again, now it seems like all, all these, the, the reflection and refraction, we don't have overrides on them. So right now, again, for the refraction and the reflection, the unified sampler is doing all the work. We don't want that. We want the, the local samples to do all the work. So you might say, how can I test to see how the specular actually is looking? Or the refraction is actually looking by itself. One way you could do this, and hopefully when Redshift gets its own custom frame buffer, it'll be a lot easier to do this process since you'll be able to swap between it, you know, as you're rendering and saving your own images. But until then, you got to do this the, the old school way. And so, under the AOV tab, we're going to add the diffuse filter, which is the diffuse image with no specular, no nothing. The diffuse lighting, which is the light, but we already cleaned that up. The GI raw, right now there is no GI, but once I turn it back on, this layer will have the GI. Reflections and refractions. So now that I, I, I just rendered this scene, what's going to end up happening is, if we open up Photoshop, <clears throat> and you can do this in Nuke, you can do it in, in another app, and you open one of those AOVs that rendered out. So let's, let's open up the... Uh, the reflections. We open up reflections and now we're looking at the the AOV, the reflections all by themselves. And we zoom in here. You can see that it's pretty, you know, it's got some noise going on in some spots. And so we're going to keep this image and we're going to render out another test render. And this time though, we're going to override the uh, reflections. So now we're going to, let's just go with double again, why not? 512. And we're going to hit render. So we're going to wait a little second. Now it's rendering. And see the reason why you want to look at these through the AOVs is because you c it's it's actually really hard to tell once you have everything else, you know, the, 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 the diffuse shader and all that other stuff. It gets in the way and it's hard to tell, is it really clean? Or, you know, it, or is it not? Because you have all this other information, all this other stuff, and it gets even more confusing once the GI kicks in. And so, now that we have the, that render again, now we'll, we'll open up Photoshop again, and we'll, we're going to drag in that new, that new uh, version, and let's zoom out. Let's place it in the exact same spot. And now let's compare and contrast. So new version, old version, 
So, as you can see, it's already cleaning up a little bit. But it's, you know, maybe maybe it's not clean enough. And obviously, you don't have to go perfect. Like, if your AOVs aren't perfect, like super smooth. Because, like I said, once you have all the other stuff on top, GI, refraction, all that other stuff, it kind of blends it away. So you don't have to go that much stronger. But... Let's let's do another one. So let's let's save this out, and let's try doubling it again. Ten twenty four, and let's render that out and see what happens. So each time I'm increasing this, this is going to increase render times a little bit. As you can tell, now it's starting to get a little slower, but our results are also getting cleaner. It's so, okay. Once this finishes rendering, we'll load up the next version in Photoshop and see how it how it looks. And so, let's bring Photoshop back up. Let's drag it in. And let's see how it's looking. And okay, it's even cleaner now. Now, obviously, you could keep doing this and, and going and going and going. But if you compare this now to our first version, see, big difference. Especially on the on these reflections right here. And so, let's say you, you wanted to clean this up even more uh, in the end. You could then use the uh, adaptive error threshold. But this is the last thing you want to slide around. So first you want to just get your samples down overall. And I think that that's clean enough for our purposes. You won't notice the difference that much once we have the GI and everything else on. Like I said earlier, it starts to kind of blend all together. And so let's open up our, our refraction. And I'm sure it's, it's going to look fine at, at 512. Let's just do a render. And so, for the next render, I'm going to turn GI back on. Let's see. And the GI is usually what takes quite a bit to calculate, especially for interiors. I wouldn't actually recommend using brute force for an interior. I would recommend a radiance cache, but since, again... I'm not covering the, those GI engines. That'll be a totally separate tutorial. This is just about the unified sampling and local sampling system. And so now the render's done. Let's uh, bring up Photoshop again, and we'll we'll close this because we're satisfied with the the reflections. And now we're going to just check out the refraction. And refraction looks looks fine. You know, looks plenty clean to me. So cool, that's good to go. So now let's get back to um, our settings. So now we have overrides for the light. The light's clean, the refraction's clean, and the reflection is it's clean enough. Once we turn all all of this together, I mean you can't you know you can't really tell if it's grainy or not on on the walls or any of that stuff right here. Now that the shaders and stuff are turned back on, and so let's turn on GI. And we're going to just go brute force again because um, this is the simplest of the GIA engines, but the noisiest, and, for interiors especially. And I'll be covering the other ones in another video. And so, right now, right the number of rays is at 16, which is less than 256. So basically, it's only going to do up to 256 and not be adaptive about it. So we're going we're gonna to do a render. So I can compare and contrast the difference between keeping it beneath and not taking advantage of the local samples system and going beyond it with 512. And so let this take a second and load up.
And so as you can see, the, the just turning GI on, since it's bouncing around 15 times because I have it on on 15 bounces, that's increasing the, the render time quite a bit. I mean, it's not massive, but you get the idea. And so you could already see some GI noise going on in some spots. And so let's zoom that out. Actually, I should probably switch back to uh, smaller bucket sizes. I think I got it at 256. 128 is usually a little better. It depends on, on your your graphics card and how much memory VRAM it has and, and whatnot. So that's, but that again, I'll, I'll cover that in a totally separate um, tutorial series. And so it's doing its thing, rendering away. And actually, I'm going to pause this just so I don't waste time since the video is already getting pretty long. So let me pause this. Okay, so we're back after the rendering. And the image took 3 minutes and 36 seconds at 1440 by 810. So we're going to zoom in. And I mean, you know, it's not bad. It's a little noisy in spots and corners. And again, like I said, brute force isn't the cleanest option for an interior like this. It's actually the hardest thing brute force has cleaning up, which is why I actually picked brute force so you could see the, the differences a lot better. And um, so now we're going to actually go to the GI, and we're actually going to turn basically the... Uh, the samples on so it works the GI instead of the unified sampling. So now we're gonna we're gonna do 512, which is double the max samples, and we're gonna save that. And we're actually gonna open it up in Photoshop so we can see the difference. So here's the GI raw AOV, and here's what we got. So this is the raw. GI rendered out and as you can see it's you know it's pretty noisy actually when you look at it for what it is by itself and you, you, you can't really tell you know in this image it doesn't look too bad and that's just because there's there's all this other stuff going on the, the lighting and everything else which makes it hard to see and so now that we've got 512 we're gonna try another render and see how it actually uh, compares. So let's try that out. And I'm going to hit render. Hopefully this one doesn't actually take as long. It doesn't seem like it will. It's already looking like it's going a bit faster. And um, again, the reason why it is going faster is because the unified sampler now isn't doing all the work originally it was doing all the work for the GI and so now that we have a larger number here than the max the local sample system is taking care of the GI and again for an interior like this brute force is is tough because it, it's noisier it doesn't cheat its way through irradiance cache and irradiance point cloud would clean this up and it would be squeaky clean super sharp and clean and smooth and probably render in about the same time if not less and like I said I'll cover that in a completely different tutorial because that it, it, there's a whole bunch of other settings and stuff and this video would get way too long to try to cover all that and so I will cover one small thing though when it comes to, to noise and uh, anti-aliased edges so you zoom in here and you look at this there's this kind of little anti-alias stepping going on and the reason that's happening is because this light is basically there's a big plain light behind here and it's super bright and so Redshift has a little bit of trouble cleaning up edges where this light is at and so there's two ways to get rid of well there's three ways to get rid of this you either increase the samples of this light a ton which you know could be a lot slower. You clamp the uh, 
intensity of the light, which makes it easier for it to to process it because this light intensity is so extreme that it's actually having difficulty cleaning up the, the edges where the light is making contact. Or, which I would personally do, which is the, the cheapest and, and lightest method, is increase the uh, filtering size or method to either Box, Triangle, Gauss, Mitchell, etc. And Gauss is kind of like the, the middle of the ground. The, it's, the, it's the medium. Mitchell's sharper, and it goes sharper down or blurrier up. Personally, I just stick to Gauss. And uh, so, okay, th th this image already rendered. And look at the difference in time. I mean, this is 2 minutes and 37 seconds. And this is 3 minutes and 30, uh, 36 seconds. I mean, it's a whole minute. And that might not sound like a lot, but in an animation, a whole minute per frame extra is that's hours. And so now let's compare the noise differences. So we're going to open up the new version and let's line it all up and so if we zoom in here and we compare the two the noise is already a little bit better but it's not a huge you know it's not huge but if you wanted to clean this up more we can increase the the um, GI samples and since we afforded extra time in just doing this if we went to 1024, which is, you know, quite a bit larger. And actually, let's uh, keep that open. Let's keep the latest version open so we can compare the two. And uh, let's do another saved render. And let's do another render. So now we doubled the GI samples. And actually, uh, I'll show you what the, the filtering does. So since we're getting these little jaggies, the stepping here, we'll increase the filter size. I don't know. Let's try 4 or 3, 3.5, 3. 5, three. <laughs> Let's try 3. And so these little types of jaggies that are going on everywhere, we could just process the filtering of the image a little different, and that will actually save us render time instead of increasing samples more than we need them. And so let's do another render. And again, we literally doubled the GI gradient of, of samples it can fire. And I, I can bet you that this is probably going to still render faster than, than it did when the unified sampler was doing all the work. And again, the reason is because you don't want the unified sampler doing anything outside of anti-aliasing, depth of field, or motion blur. That's what this is for. You, you, the unified sampler is supposed to do that type of work. And all your local samples, this is for everything else. You you want to make these do all the heavy lifting. And then what's left over, your anti-aliasing, motion blur, depth of field, stuff like that will get done by this. And let's say you, you do have an image that has a ton of motion blur or depth of field. You might not even have to increase these that much because there's so much depth of field and motion blur that you could just stick to making the unified sampling engine do most of the work. And that works, you know, sometimes. But since this image has none of those effects, we want this to do the least amount of work and have the local samples do most of the heavy lifting. And so, you know, the render's coming along. Let's zoom in. And now the GI is even cleaner in this corner. And so now let's zoom into this area, actually. And you can see that the stepping got a little better see the AA is is changing and so this is kind of a way to cheat it you can basically just increase the filtering so it's a little blurrier in the aliasing in the way it filters the entire image and so you could do that or you could lower the max um, intensity for the light or you can increase samples increasing samples you know means slower renders so I'd rather just go with uh, the filtering size and it's good to go and personally I feel like a, a little softer filtering gives the image a little more of a photographic look when it's super sharp you know it kind of feels too digital it's too clean so I personally like a little higher filtering I usually 
at least use three, sometimes four. And so, okay, render's about to finish. And again, look at this. We got two minutes and 35 seconds. And the last frame rendered a little slower. So why is that? And this is going to have to go back to basically, I'm going to assume what we were talking about with the uh, the ray bundle packets. So basically, I'm sure this one has a little more steps because we gave it a, a larger, um, basically, group to work with. So the gradient's a little larger. So even though the engine's smart enough, it says, you know, we're going to stop at X amount of noise. It's smart enough between both two both images, but this one has probably a couple more steps, so it's able to figure out when to stop or when to keep going a little sooner. And so, cool. We got double the, the uh, GI rays, and we got a, a second or two more time, you know. And so, let's check out the difference. So, you know, open up Photoshop again, drag that in. And let's zoom in here. And it's still noisy, but you see, it's already cleaning up quite a bit, actually. It cleaned it up quite a lot. And so you could keep going, you know, cleaner and cleaner. But at this point, you know, when you look at it as a whole together, it feels plenty clean to me. You know, if you, if you wanted to really clean this up, you'd use a Radiance Cache. But... You could add more samples, so you could, you know, double this again, you know, 2048. And keep going and basically checking the uh, GI in Photoshop or Nuke or whatever and just making sure that the the AOV is looking good. The pass is like, oh, okay, it's a little cleaner. And then, you know, you decide when you want it to stop. That's one way of doing it. But let's say we're satisfied. We're, we're satisfied with, okay, 1024 max. And 1024, 512, 512 for our other local samples. And our minimum 16 and our max 256 for unified. So this is where the adaptive error threshold comes in. We've left it at stock this whole time. And so here you can, now that you're, you're satisfied with all your samples across the board, you can actually speed up your render for viz dev purposes or slow, slow it down and get a cleaner image by adjusting this now. Now you can leave everything else alone. So let's say I increase this to point, point 0.1, you know, so we're going to go up quite a bit, point 0.1. We're going to get a way faster render because now the engine is saying, you know what, it's clean enough sooner. It's not as uh, sensitive to noise. And so it's going to be a noisier image, obviously, but it's going to render quite a bit faster. Because now the engine's just saying, eh, it's clean enough, move on. Clean enough, move on. A lot sooner, because its sensitivity is, is not as strong. So here we go. You zoom in, and it's a lot noisier. But it's also rendering a lot faster. And so let's say now we wanted a cleaner image than we had previously, than this one. Instead of actually going in there and adjusting each thing, you know, like the GI and all that by itself, we can just make it more sensitive to noise on a per pixel basis across the board, across the whole image. And so all we got to do is drop it to lower than we had it before. So it rendered at 45 seconds. And as you can see, it's quite a bit noisier, you know, compared to the, the last one, but 45 seconds, you know. And so let's actually make it more sensitive this time around. And so... Uh, and actually, well, let's check out the GI again, because now you'll get to see the difference also in GI. And so, yeah, it, it the adaptive error threshold affects everything. And so now it's, you know, it's a t t way noisier. And so, again, bigger numbers means it cares l less about noise. It's not as intelligent. So 0.8, this is going to just be super noisy. <laughs> And it's going to render, you know, just boom, 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 boom. It's going through it. And obviously, you know, crazy noise. And let's uh, cancel that, actually. So let's say now we wanted a cleaner image. 
Let's go to point zero zero three. You know, and this is tiny. This is actually where I would say once you're ready for your final render, point zero zero three, point zero zero two. That's usually you know a good range. You can go, you know. Right now, our our image was still pretty clean at the stock point. 01 and the reason is because we actually figured out nice local sample settings for everything else but if we go a little smaller we should get a cleaner image so let's go to point zero three and this is going to increase the render time i'm sure maybe double but it's also going to make a way cleaner image and the reason being again because now it's a lot more sensitive about the noise it detects and that's what this controls noise detection basically sensitive on the low end not sensitive on the high end and again this is using brute force I would use radiance cache for an interior like this and it would just be way cleaner we probably wouldn't even have to go this low on the adaptive error threshold and we probably could have stuck to point zero one and it would have came out just as clean and so let's zoom in here and do a comparison and so if we s switch between the two you could already see some noise compared to where we had it before at point zero one and then you go to oh well, <laughs> let's go somewhere else it's a little noisy yeah I guess this area and you swap between the two and you can see some more noise pop up and this this one was using 0 0.01 this one's using 0 0.003 more sensitive so if we, let's really zoom in there and you see little little noise artifacts swap back to the the high the more sensitive adaptivity and it's way smoother of a gradient so that's basically what that does and as you can see in being more sensitive to noise and detecting it it also increases render time but it allows you to keep your sampling settings you know where you had them where you were happy with and then you just basically told it you know what be more sensitive about the noise or be less sensitive if you wanted faster renders to while you're you know moving stuff around or checking out shaders or whatever and so i don't recommend going this low until you're 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 done you know you're going to do your final render drop it down to something like 0 0.002 003 and just let it do its thing and you'll get much cleaner renders with the added you know render time and so I'm gonna pause this because I don't know how long this is gonna take and then we'll get back to it so you can see the difference and then we'll look at the differences of the GI for example the pass and uh, so let's pause this so the renderings done and again this is quite a bit slower it's up to six minutes now because the adaptive error threshold is a lot lower and so now it's being a lot more sensitive about noise and so if we zoom in to this corner for example it's a lot cleaner than it used to be when it was right here when it was rendering at 237 and so you could just huge difference you could already see it even on the wall right here and stuff and so that's how you could control how sensitive you want the uh, engine to be basically sampling noise and so if we uh, check out the GI raw let's bring in the newest one I mean just look at that huge difference zoom in right here and look at that that's what what it's doing and it's not just doing this for the GI like like I said the adaptive error threshold increases the sensitivity to all noise so to everything the specular everything that's that's in the scene a a everything everything and so this is a good slider to then once you're satisfied with your um, sampling and your min and max and all that once you're satisfied you could just slide this up or down to control how how you feel about noise and render time like let's say it's like oh this is you know it's nice and clean but I don't want to wait this long and I don't mind a little more noise well then you know just make this point zero zero five or eight or, or 
back to 0 0.01 you know and then that let this lets you control that and so your settings are still the same across the board all you're doing is saying i want a little more noise you know and at, for faster renders i don't mind or you can decrease it and say i really want you to attack all the noise more intelligently and and be more sensitive about it but you know with the added cost of it has to fire more rays because it's more sensitive about things and so that just about covers everything and again I'll be um, linking the image and I, I, in the future I will be covering the different cache engine the Iranians cache and all the other GI options and the number of GI bounces and whatnot and <clears throat> For example, th this actually changes render times a lot because it's making the light rays bounce 15 times. So, like, if I brought this down to the stock, which I believe is 4, and let's just save it. When I hit render, I'm sure this is going to render a lot faster. But it's also going to lose um, light in the room because it's not bouncing around as often. And, you know, sometimes you don't need that many. I just use the max for this example just because if you drop this down, I think three or four is the uh, what it comes with automatically. And so if you bring it down to four, let's say your scene didn't need that many bounces. Like, so, you know, as you can tell, it's already rendering way faster because the lights don't have to bounce as often, which add more, basically more render time because it's processing more bounces. We go through between the two. I mean, they're, they're both almost identical except that though the one with more bounces you see more of that reddish pinkish hue and that's because it's picking up it the uh, the gi is basically picking up the bounce light off the floor and so in this version it's not as uh prevalent because it's not bouncing around as often again see so but it's it's subtle so you know for depending on your image just keep that in mind Find the sweet spot where you feel like, oh, the GI looks good enough. And if you don't need more, you know, don't bother with it. In, because it, it does add quite a lot of render time. And so, this just, I figured I'd bring this up just because it, it relates to render times. And, and sampling and how things can take a little longer. And so, just um, keep that in mind. You know, if, if you don't need the GI to be you know splashing color back from the walls and everything all nice and gi like <laughs> you don't have to do it you know and it'll save you a lot of render time even though all the other local samples and settings are, are exactly the same and whether you increase it or, or decrease it dictates more render time or not so i'll pause it and we'll compare the two just so you can check them out so the render just finished with four GI bounces and we got a time of 431. So compared to the six minutes and four seconds we got when we have 15 bounces, you know, that's a quite a lot of time shaved off. And so if you swap between the two, it's a really subtle difference. And I mean, but you could, you can notice it, you know, it's, it's in there. So like, let's, let's blow this up and swap between the two see you get more of the, the the red hues bouncing back and hitting the back the shadowed parts the ceilings the walls on this on the on the 15 bounce version see and it's subtle but it makes a difference and so if you you know you're going for maximum realism or whatever and uh, then yeah go all go for it sometimes we're just doing an animation and you know doesn't really matter <laughs> It's subtle enough that it doesn't, you know, you're not going to notice it. Then, by all means, you know, cut back on the GI bounces and save yourself some render time. And so, but that's something a setting to keep in mind if you're trying to cut back on render times, or if you're trying to get that nice glow going on of all the GI bounce lights. And so, yeah, this video basically cut, you know covers all the local sample information you need and how the unified sampling engine works and so to recap basically just remember you want your local samples
that you can override as a whole throughout your image or individually on each individual light or end material to be larger than your max samples and to use the adaptive error threshold to control how sensitive the uh, in engine is to noise levels. So lower means more sensitive, higher means less sensitive to noise. And that about covers it.